Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Ripley's Aquarium of Canada. My name's Katie. I'm the manager of education and conservation here at the aquarium. And this is part two in our conservation conversation series. Uh, so this is a, a series of, of interviews that we're bringing you over the next few weeks on uh, interesting conservation topics related to things we care about here at the aquarium. So today I'm pleased to introduce Mark Gadden from the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, who's gonna be speaking to us about lampreys. So if you've been to the aquarium in the last year and a half, which not many people have been able to, you might've been able to check out the lampreys in this exhibit behind me, which is in our current changeable exhibit called Shipwrecks. So Mark is joining us today from Michigan and he spent most where he's grown up and spent most of his professional career working to protect and improve the Great Lakes. Dr. Gavin serves as the communications director and legislative liaison for the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, which is a joint US Canadian agency established by treaty to improve and perpetuate Great Lakes fishery. He's been with the Fisheries Commission since 1995 and worked extensively on issues involving regional coordination of fisheries policies, invasive species and ecosystem restoration. Prior to joining the Great Lakes Fishery Commission Secretariat, Dr. Gadden has worked as a legislative assistant for the US House of Representatives Great Lakes Task Force, researching, proposing and advocating legislation on the benefit of the Great Lakes region. Dr. Gadden has his PhD from the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment and is an, currently an adjunct professor at the School of Environment and Sustainability with the University of Michigan and an adjunct associate professor with the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Michigan State University. His research and teaching interests relate to human dimensions of natural resource management. Currently, he teaches the course Global Water at the University of Michigan program in the environment, and he's also the faculty advisor for the University of Michigan fishing team. Welcome, Mark. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here and talking to us all about the super creepy and amazing sea lamprey. Can yes, you start by telling us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, so that was a great introduction and thanks for having me. Uh, I work on the policy side of it. I'm not a biologist, but uh, I deal in invasive species policy and water policy. And that's very important because uh, we have decision makers out there that uh, will be uh, directing government policy and making decisions, not just on say rules and regulations and laws, but also how money is spent. And invasive species are uh, something that we need to pay very close attention to. So part of my job is to communicate uh, with the powers that be to um, talk about how important invasive species control are and hopefully to get some good policies out of it. Okay, so what's currently, what's going on with sea lampreys in the Great Lakes? What, what, why should we be concerned about lampreys in general? Sea lampreys are invasive. Uh, they made their way into the Great Lakes through shipping canals, first seen in Lake Ontario off uh, the shores of Toronto. Uh, probably in the uh, maybe 1830s or 1840s, uh, made their way in through shipping canals constructed in upstate New York um, that connected uh, the, uh, the lake to the Atlantic Ocean via those canals. And then about 1920, the Welland Canal was uh, renovated, in fact, completely rebuilt really, which allowed the lamprey to get past Niagara Falls. Um, that was obviously too big of a barrier for the, them to swim into Lake Erie um, through that route. Uh, so they made it past Niagara Falls about 1920, and um, the rest is history, they say. They um, invaded Lake Erie about 1921, uh, um, seen in Lake Michigan in 1936, uh, Lake Huron in 1937, and Lake Superior about 1939. And it was a perfect storm, really, for invasion, the lamprey. Uh, almost near, near unlimited spawning habitat. So they had tons of streams to invade and, and uh, make more of themselves, so spread around. Almost an unlimited food supply of succulent fish that the lamprey like, um, trout and salmon and walleye, even sturgeon. Now the lamprey will uh, destroy sturgeon species. And then nothing keeping them in check. And that's a problem with invasive species. If they make their home in a new ecosystem uh, and they don't evolve with the species there, there's a, a very real possibility that they can um, do their damage uh, unchecked with nothing uh, keeping them suppressed. That's why lamprey are such a problem in the Great Lakes. They, they adapted very well to freshwater head, an unlimited buffet of fish to eat and nothing keeping them uh, in check. And be a very, very large problem in the Great Lakes. 
we kind of have joked back and forth getting ready for this interview about lampreys being the stuff of nightmares. Uh, yeah. They are very creepy looking if people aren't familiar with them. Uh, how is it that they actually hurt fish? Like, how are they eating them? Yeah, the business end of a lamprey, the mouth there is, um, you know, it's defining characteristic really. It is alien looking. I see you have it up on the screen. So that mouth is a suction cup, actually. It's round. And um, if you attach it to your, say, the palm of your hand or your forehead, if you're brave <laughs> or whatever, um, th that is a suction cup. Um, the lamprey won't be feeding on warm-blooded creatures, but it will grab on because it has nothing else to do and it, and it wants to um, just get a hold of something. And you actually have to break the seal to get it off of you. Those teeth that you see that ring the mouth, they're uh, horn-shaped. And they, um, with the force of the suction cup, the teeth will also then embed in the flesh there and uh, help the mouth just not go anywhere, say, slide around. And in the middle there, you see that, um, that tongue. That tongue is like a drill. It flicks out of the mouth and it drills through the uh, scales and skin of the fish. And then it'll feed on the blood and body fluids of that fish, usually killing uh, the fish. So during its parasitic phase, where it's swimming around the open lake, uh, preying on fish after fish after fish and feeding on the fish's blood, uh, that lamprey will kill about 20, 25 kilograms of fish during that parasitic phase. Uh, we sometimes call them the vampires of the Great Lakes because they, they feed on blood and body fluids. Um, and if it doesn't kill the fish outright, it'll leave a wound uh, that's often lethal to the fish. It'll become infected. Um, and um, they're just very, very destructive. Again, nothing keeps them in check. So they'll just move on to uh, other fish species. Again, you can see on the screen there, that's what lamprey look like um, beyond their mouth. They're uh, long and thin and snake-like. They're often called lamprey eels, but they're not related to eels. They just look like eels. And in fact, they give eels a bad name. Uh, eels are native in the Great Lakes and um, certainly Lake Ontario and are part of the ecosystem. But uh, lamp sea lampreys are invasive and destructive uh, to the Great Lakes. Uh, but yeah, you can see they're very snaky-like uh, uh, as well. And you're saying it's like a, a perfect storm when they arrived and that they've, they've had a huge impact historically on the fishery like that the numbers are massive of like how much the fishery crashed after the lampreys were introduced am i right it was massive and it was sad you know i'm a historian as well by training and um, i've been reading quite um, extensively of the literature of this and the literature both in the scientific literature you know with the scientists um talking about you know who are collecting data on fish abundances um, before and after the sea lamprey invasion documented that um, quite um, ably in the, uh, in the scientific literature. But when you read the human side of it as well um, in newspaper accounts or at congressional or parliamentary hearings, and there were several of those in the um, 30s, 40s, and early 50s when, when people were pleading with government to do something about this. Is there anything you can do? Um, and the, those stories that you got from the, uh, from the people who fished the Great Lakes and made a living out of it, uh, or even the people who fished it recreationally. Um, you know, if you were up in Lake Superior, you listened to your fellow commercial fishers down in the lower lakes uh, grappling with this, and you knew it was coming. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't oblivious to what was coming uh, in the uh, upper Great Lakes when they would hear from what was going on in the lower Great Lakes. And imagine how sad that is if you were a you know, if that's if you were a multi generational family making your living that way, uh, and you were watching what was happening in slow motion horror, um, and you knew it was coming, that was what they contended with. Changed a way of life, um, uh, put some out of business, or um, you know, forced them to reckon with the fact that the fishery was forever going to be uh, changed because of this invasive species, and the economic consequences, of course. Uh, were there along with the ecosystem consequences. So you mentioned that people were really eager for government agencies to do something, and they have. So what is it that, what work is being done currently to control the sea lamprey population? Well, in the early days, uh, say the 1940s and 50, early 50s, uh, the first thing that needed to happen was they needed to understand the life cycle of this critter to say, um, how does, where does it live? Where does it spawn? How does it behave? 
And um, then can you develop control techniques that would be selective to that species? And what do I mean by that is that um, it's not difficult to kill fish, actually, whether it's by, you know, you know, commercial fishing, like taking them out or even putting a poison in a river. It is very difficult to get rid of what you want to get rid of and to leave other fish unharmed. Uh, that's the holy grail, really, for invasive species control. Can you target exactly what you want to target? And that's what they set out to do. So in the 1950s, early 1950s, um, they discovered that lamprey live as larvae and stream beds. And then uh, metamorphos, they go through a very strange metamorphosis where they go from being like a worm-like larvae to that lethal adult, and they, they metamorphose into that uh, lethal adult grow that suction cup mouth and um, spend their time out in the lake preying on fish, like attached to fish, like you see here. Well, once they're out in the lake doing that uh, destruction, it's too late to do anything about it. You're not gonna catch them. So can you kill them before they emerge from the stream beds and go out and do their damage? The uh, quest was, was to discover a pesticide that would kill the lamprey larvae um, and leave other fish in wildlife um, unharmed. They tested about 10,000 different chemicals in the 19, mid 1950s and actually discovered one that would do just that. At the concentration applied, it would kill lamprey larvae and, um, un, and not harm um, fish. It was a miraculous discovery and, it's, and it saved the Great Lakes fishery. That um, lampricide, and we can call it that, it's a pesticide selective to lamprey, so it's a lampricide has been applied to uh, sea lamprey streams, about 100 um, producing streams um, a year um, in the Great Lakes Basin on a rotation. And uh, it's able to remove about 98% of the lamprey larvae that, they're li that is living in those stream beds. And that's um, why it's been, uh, the control program has been so su successful. Uh, lamprey control is the only, uh, control program for an invasive species done at a basin-wide level, like at geographically large level anywhere in the world, and anything that's selective to the uh, species you're going after. So it's a remarkable success. Yeah, that's really amazing that they were able to find something that would work so specifically on this one species, this one organism, and leave all the others healthy and able to thrive. Uh, yeah. that's, that's some pretty miraculous science there. And, and they knew it at the time that it needed to be selective or they, you know, that's why they just test, kept testing and testing and persevered. It was a moonshot. Uh, and it's, it never ceases to amaze me how determined these people were in the mid 1950s to discover this. And today, just how grateful we are to that uh, discovery um, because we don't have any other options with other species. So think about Asian uh, carp, for example which are um, species of invasive carps that are um, uh, threatening the Great Lakes. Um, there's no selective uh, way to control those species right now. Scientists actually are taking a, a bit of um, you know, lessons from history and saying, if we could do it with sea lampreys, why can't we do it for these invasive carps? Uh, and very much motivated by the fact that it is doable, but it takes um, science, it takes money, takes government uh, determination to, um, to persevere for the long haul to find those solutions. But economically, it's important too. The fishery is worth $7 billion annually to the people of the United States and Canada. Uh, the lamprey control effort um, is a very, very small fraction, the amount of money that we spend every year to control uh, uh, sea lampreys compared to that economic value. Uh, what you stand to lose is quite substantial. So it's worth making these investments now um, if you want to uh, be able to save uh, the fishery that you have. I should also point out, by the way, that the, the, the best um, approach is to not let them in in the first place. Right. So lamprey are here to stay. Um, there are several other species like zebra mussels and the like that are here to stay. But Asian carps um, are not yet. Um, established in the Great Lakes, and it's worth the effort to try and keep that from happening. Yeah, for sure. Like, there's not any chance, right, that we'll be able to 100% remove lampreys from the Great Lakes in the future, unless there's some sort of other amazing scientific breakthrough, I would imagine. 
each female lamprey could have upwards of 100,000 eggs. And, uh, you know, if you, if you, even, even as successful as we are, there's still a, you know, maybe two or three percent that are left in the system after a lamprey treatment. We can't get every, every one of them. So it really only takes a few mating pairs to, um, to really let those lamprey um, produce another generation. So chasing that last mating pair of lamprey in the Great Lakes is, um, is uh, cost prohibitive, um, even if it were possible. Uh, they've, they've infested the system. That's not to say that um, it's impossible. Um, who knows if scientists, scientists are very, you know, they're, that's what they do. Um, they research and they find solutions and um, uh, science has saved us and, um, and it will always, um, you know, uh, be capable of doing that. And there is considerable amount of research going into uh, not just sea lampreys, but also other uh, species to see if you can um, find these scientific solutions to that. So I will, I will never say never, because um, if you ask the people in the 1940s that were watching the, um, the lamprey horror show playing out, uh, would we have a selective pesticide that would reduce lamprey populations by 95%? and uh, have a seven billion dollar fishery emerge they probably would have laughed in your face mm -hmm. but um look at where we are today and so I'll, I'll never say it's impossible because i have great faith in science awesome. are there any native species of lamprey in the great lakes that would be filling a similar niche normally i'm glad you asked yes there are um actually uh you know when i speak of um, sea lampreys these are the invasive um, cousins and the virulent uh, invasive cousins of harmless uh, native lampreys that exist in the Great Lakes. Lampreys are um, common throughout the world um, and in the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes are no exception. The lampreys in the Great Lakes that are native um, evolved with the fish that are here. Um, two of the four species of native lampreys um, are uh, non-parasitic, so they live in that you know, in, in the larvae phase and say upper reaches of streams and are um, a, 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 just a part of the food web and a good vital part of that. There are a couple of native species that are parasitic, but they, they are much, much smaller than the, um, the invasive uh, sea lamprey cousins that um, give them a bad name. And those native uh, parasitic lamprey um, tend to be more uh, on the true parasitic side, where they might um, benefit from their host but not kill the host, where you know the lamp, the sea lampreys will uh, kill the host. So uh, we are definitely, um, you know, not anti-lamprey. We are anti-invasive sea lamprey, which uh, are are just um, very troubling in the Great Lakes, and they will never um, bring fall into equilibrium in the Great Lakes. There's just that's they're just lethal now in the Great Lakes. But I will also say there's in the great, you know, irony of the world, um, the sea lamprey uh, that are where, where they're native, um, think about, you know, like Europe, um, North America um, and um, England, you know, the like, um, they're threatened there because of dams and, and um, other structures and habitat loss. So there are actually restoration efforts for sea lampreys in those parts of the world, uh, which, you know, I, I really, um, wish them well in that because they are part of the native ecosystems and um, they are beneficial that way. In the Great Lakes, no, it's the opposite. They, they're, they're problematic. And, and so uh, that's just sometimes uh, the world works in that funny way. Yeah, maybe they'd like some of ours back. I say, how many do you want? We got asked, you know, <laughs> about, there's a funny tradition in England, for example, where uh, the city of Gloucester uh, since medieval days, um, uh, Middle Ages would send a, uh, a lamprey pie to the reigning monarch and cel for celebration purposes, because uh, lamprey are again native in English streams. You know, think the um, the Avon or the Severn River, the Thames. You know, mm -hmm. and um, in 2002, I think there was a jubilee, and they were going to send Queen Elizabeth her her um, due lamprey pie. Couldn't get any from the UK because they were protected. So they called us and, and said, "Hey, would you mind?" And we're like, uh, uh, "No. How many um, <laughs> how many bowls of these would you like?" You know. So we were able to. We've been doing it now for um, you know twenty years, supplying the um, the good people of Gloucester with the lamprey, so they can continue that middle age tradition to send the queen her uh, lamprey pie. Are they good to eat? No. 
Uh, well, certainly not the Great Lakes um, uh, sea lampreys and other parts of the world uh, where they're um, native and, um, you know, say live their life in salt water and get, by the way, get much bigger. Um, they are eaten um, and uh, they are, um, you know, a delicacy in some parts. But in the Great Lakes, they're smaller um, than, um, say, the Atlantic ones. They tend to be pretty uh, ratty by the time you can catch them. Uh, their digestive systems have shut down, so their bodies are actually full of, um, you know, uh, uh, bile acids and um, things that just don't taste all that good. And then sadly in the Great Lakes, um, being at the top of the food web, they also do bioaccumulate um, all of the, um, any chemicals that might be in the Great Lakes, um, especially feeding on blood. And so they tend to be very high in mercury uh, being at the top of the food web. But they're very difficult to catch anyway. We, we have, um, you know, in the early days um, before lamprey were brought under control, folks thought they could do it with, uh, say, creating a commercial industry for them. And nobody ever made it uh, go economically. Uh, we get um, every once in a while, folks will give it a try. Um, and it's, it's just not something that's ever going to be uh, economically viable. But I've never tried one. I don't want to. Um, I've heard from folks who have that um, the Great Lakes sea lampreys are just not all that good. And by the way, I'd take a piece of trout and salmon anyway that's native to the system uh, over uh, a lamprey any day of the week. Absolutely. They're delicious. Yeah. Yeah, yep. It's interesting. We talk about um, some invasive species usually here with students. So, like both Great Lakes invasives, but also uh, the lionfish is a big one that is an animal that we display here at the aquarium that is inv invasive to the Gulf of Mexico. And there they are trying to like really encourage it as a food source because you can eat it. And it's maybe one way to help control the population is to encourage it as a fishery for human consumption. But I guess that's not in the cards for the lamprey. It's not in the cards uh, for the lamprey, and there really aren't. Um, there are some fish that are not native to the Great Lakes that um, are naturalized, we call that, you know, and so some of these were even introduced on purpose, like um, Pacific salmon um, and, um, and, and steelhead uh, brown trout, for example. And those, of course, were brought in for a purpose. Uh, one of that was to control the alewife, which is an invasive species that um, is a ha small herring-like fish that they eat. And uh, if you put in top predators to munch them up, you uh, also create a fishery for that. But otherwise, I can't really think of many um, uh, invasive species in the Great Lakes that would uh, be economically viable or a food source. You, know, you think zebra mussels, you need, <laughs> you need an awful lot of those. That, you know, they're the size of your pinky fingernail uh, to, uh, to, to make a meal, but I, I say that tongue in cheek. Um, mm -hmm. Really um, invasive species you want to keep out in the first place because they're really gonna do a lot more economic damage than they are gonna bring an economic benefit. And I understand where, you, where, where they're coming from in terms of the lionfish. If you dealt lemonades, maybe you try and make, if you dealt lemons, maybe you try and make lemonade and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and do that because really what other choice do you have? But our goal at the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and certainly the management agencies like at the province of Ontario are trying very hard to keep these out because the, the damage that they do is just, it's, it's, it's way going to outshadow the, any economic benefits that you get from it. Mm -hmm. And again, I'd rather have a piece of trout or salmon that are, um, you know, that are native here like Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario than, um, than uh, having to make do with, um, with the invasive species that you didn't want in the first place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I think even beyond the, the economic impacts too, the the impact to biodiversity. So uh, the round goby is often invasive species that we talk about here at the aquarium and how, you know, like all invasives typically are very successful because they eat a lot and they're not discriminating about what they eat. They reproduce a lot and they have no predators. So it's easy for them to take over and outcompete all of the native fish uh, yeah. for those reasons. Well, I'll give you an example of that too. There's um, a, one invasive species called the um, spiny water flea or bithotrephes. Mm -hmm. uh, the anglers who are listening will definitely know what I'm talking about. These are the little tiny, tiny, tiny um, zooplankter that uh, will uh, kind of gum up the end of your fishing rod as you reel it in just with a glob of these things. But normally you really, you can almost not see it with the naked, one of them with the naked eye, but you'll get a glob of them. These uh, have, uh, came, they came in through ballast water in, a sh in ships, got discharged. Oh. 
We might have lost Mark momentarily. It looks like he might be frozen there. Oh dear. So while we're just waiting for Mark to reconnect, I'll just remind you that I am joining you today from in front of the lampreys that we have on display here at the aquarium. Uh, they're not cooperating right now. They're all hiding in the back of their exhibit. Uh, but uh, one of the questions that we always get here at the aquarium is what we feed them. And you may have noticed that Mark mentioned that as they get to be in their adult stage that their uh, digestive system degrades. So actually we don't feed them anything. At this stage that we have them here at the aquarium, they don't eat. Uh, so even creepier maybe than you appreciated. Uh, so hopefully Mark will be able to jump back on with us momentarily. Gotta love technology, play it by ear. Uh, so some of the other invasive species that we hope to be able to talk to you about in the coming weeks are the Asian carp that Mark also referenced. We're hoping to be able to bring you one of these conservation conversations around invasive uh, Asian carp in our Great Lakes. And we're also hoping to shift the focus as well to some species at risk, including the red side dates, which are also on display here in the aquarium in the shipwrecks gallery. So Mark just sent me a message saying his computer crashed on him. So I'll stay on for another minute to see if he's able to rejoin us. Uh, hopefully that, that works out. If not, we'll reconvene the conversation at another time, I guess. Um, so some other things I'll just let you know here at, that are going on here at the aquarium. Uh, coming up in May, we have Endangered Species Day. So that's on May 21st. So you'll want to tune in here on our YouTube channel to see what we're doing for Endangered Species Day. And we're gearing up for June 8th, which is a big day for us. That is World Ocean Day. And we hope to also bring you lots of special content uh, from around the aquarium about the state of the oceans and animals in general uh, on June 8th. So mark that on your calendar for sure. Just see what's happening, see if he's able to rejoin us. It's too bad, I was really enjoying this conversation about lampreys. They're so interesting in like a creepy, cool kind of way. Uh, they wouldn't bother you if you were swimming in the Great Lakes, by the way. That was going to be one of my next questions is, if I encounter a sea, la sea lamprey in Great Lakes, should I be worried that it's going to try and attach onto me? I don't think that's something that we really need to worry about. So we'll try and get some more information from him uh, if he's able to rejoin us. Uh, I'll do a plug for all of the things that are available on the aquarium website for you as well. So we've got the link up right now to our live cameras. So there's four live cameras you can check out anytime from home. You can check in with the jellyfish, uh, with our tropical fish in Rainbow Reef, with our very popular stingrays at Ray Bay. And of course, always uh, check in with the sharks in Dangerous Lagoon. So Mark should be popping back up shortly and we'll continue our conversation about sea lampreys and invasive species in the Great Lakes. Uh, so yeah, make sure you check out, you can always pop into the live camera to check out what's happening with the sand tiger sharks, the sawfish, the green sea turtles, and all of the residents of Dangerous Lagoon are there for you, for your viewing pleasure. Uh, the jellyfish are also one of my favorites when I just need a moment of zen uh, with all the craziness that's going on in the world to just have a moment to chill out and watch some super relaxing jellyfish. So continuing with Mark uh, from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, uh, we'll pop up his website if you need to, or interested in learning more about sea lampreys, there's definitely lots to learn. So you can check out sealampreycontrol.org. I also really love that the Great Lakes Fishery Commission is a partnership between the US and Canadian governments to uh, protect our shared resource of the Great Lakes. Not only is there an important fishery there, uh, some huge millions and millions of people rely on the Great Lakes for our drinking water, for agriculture, for industry, and of course, recreation. Especially, I know lots of people are taking advantage here in Toronto of being able to walk down by the lake to get some fresh air and exercise when a lot of other things are closed, including the aquarium. Yep, the aquarium is closed to the public right now. 
Uh, stay tuned to our, our website and our social media for updates on when we hope to be able to reopen. Uh, and of course, we will do that when it is safe to do so and, uh, and the government gives us the okay. <laughs> So I'll just mention, just behind me here, you can see a map of the Great Lakes. So uh, if you are needing a refresher on one, the Great Lakes, uh, what they are, the five Great Lakes, I think we mentioned them early in this conversation. So of course we've got Ontario, Superior, Michigan, Erie, and Huron are the five Great Lakes. Hi Mark, thanks for jumping back in with us. Gotta love technology. Well, you know what? I, you know, I, moving into the Zoom world, I've been on uh, Zoom calls since about eight this morning, um, and uh, as luck would have it, I guess uh, right when it really counts, like live on uh, YouTube here, I, I get that screen of death <laughs> with complete crash. So, <laughs> thank you, Microsoft. Your computer is protesting all of the video calls. I'm sure yes, it's had I enough of them too. <laughs> I think so, but uh, I don't know. One time I was giving a, t a major talk to a um, uh, a group um, at a convention, and I barely got the words out of my mouth when the fire alarm went off. So that cleared the room too. So sometimes uh, things don't go as expected. Awesome. Yeah. So if, if I decide to go swimming in Lake Ontario, do I need to be worried about a sea lamprey attaching onto my leg? Uh, unless you're going to try and swim across Lake Ontario, no. Um, lampreys don't attach to warm-blooded creatures. They're not going to feed off of um, a human or a dog or, or things like that. Um, and so you're safe, uh, certainly from lamprey. Um, a lot of people don't know if they're walking around in a stream, like say wading or if they're fishing or whatever, there might be lamprey larvae living in the stream bottoms. And again, they're harmless. They don't even have that parasitic mouth. Uh, but they're not going to attack you in the lake. Now, there's a great story um, in 1954, uh, in precisely um, uh, September of 1954, uh, there was a woman named Marilyn Bell, who's a uh, famous oh, yeah. uh, yep. Canadian, and uh, she um, set out to be the first person to swim across Lake Ontario, and she did. Uh, she went from New York to Toronto, and um, among uh, many things, complaining about body aches and cramps and and um and the cold and the like she actually had to uh, fend off lampreys as well that it had attached to her her body got cold enough to um kind of fool the lamprey but the lamprey were really attached to hitch a ride and remember this is 1954 uh, we didn't begin lamprey control until um uh in lake ontario until uh the 1970s uh, so lamprey were uh, uncontrolled in Lake Ontario, so there probably were a lot of them. And poor Marilyn Bell uh, had those attached to her, and uh, the, the the press at the time um, celebrated her swim, but also <laughs> didn't go unnoticed that she had lampreys attached to her uh, that she had to, to contend with. Oh, gosh, that sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so if people want to help out with invasive species generally or a sea lamprey in particular what kinds of things can they do well on a personal level you can you can certainly be aware of uh, what's in your bait bucket for example if you're fishing um, and don't dump live bait back into the lake once you're done uh, fishing for the day it's not unheard of for invasive species to be accidentally included in with um, with the bait um, sometimes the bait's not 100%, so um, it's best just to um, dispose of your bait on shore after you're done fishing, um, because that has been a way that invasive species has gotten into the lakes. Um, you, can all, you should also uh, inspect your boat when you pull it out. Um, if there are weeds or um, anything um, hanging in it or anything in your live well, um, empty it on land. Don't take it with you to another water body. Um, those are very important things that you can do. On a larger level, uh, call your elected officials or write them a note, um, your parliamentarians. Uh, sea lamprey control is successful. We're not scratching our heads wondering how to control lampreys, but Canada is um, behind on its uh, payments to the lamprey control program. Uh -oh. uh, so can it, I know, and, and uh, it's a binational program that's done under a treaty between the United States and Canada. And um, Canada has uh, underfunded this, and yet um, can the Canadian um, fishers benefit tremendously from this program. 
so let your parliamentarians know that um, that Canada needs to live up to its obligations under the agreement to do that. Um, not just sea lamprey control, but also the um, science that is that is done. Um, and uh, let your elected officials know that um, uh, it's important to keep invasive species like the invasive carps out of the Great Lakes. And um, it's worth a very small amount of money uh, today uh, to prevent uh, something that uh, would happen and cause economic harms forever into the future. You know, if people had taken some steps, um, uh, you know, a century ago to keep uh, sea lampreys out, we wouldn't be stuck with this problem uh, today. So an ounce of prevention, as they say. And uh, let your elected officials know that it's um, that we do not need to, we should not have to tolerate um, invasive species and the economic and ecological harms that they will cause in perpetuity. Yeah, I mean, I think this is mostly a good news story about the sea lamprey. About obviously, we didn't want them to begin with, but that we have been able to make all of these uh, amazing innovations to control them. Uh, but you know, like who knows what the next invasive species will be. Can you paint us a picture of what life might look like in the Great Lakes if something similar to the lamprey got in and we weren't able to control it? Yeah, you don't have to stretch your imagination too far, actually. Uh, the invasive carps are, um, are really a case in point. These are um, the, the, the ones that we're trying to keep out of the Great Lakes are making their way toward the lakes through the um, Mississippi River watershed. And the Mississippi River connects to the Illinois River um, in the state of Illinois ar around St. Louis and then uh, connects to the Des Plaines River. And then there's a man-made canal that connects that river to Lake Michigan. And these species of invasive carps, um, which escaped from aquaculture in the 70s, have been making their way towards the lake since. Uh, we don't need to use our imagination, really, because what they've done to the Mississippi and Illinois River systems has been um, devastating. Uh, these invasive carps have become the dominant biomass. They've, they've changed uh, the uh, commercial fishing tremendously. They've disrupted the ecosystem. Uh, these can grow to, you know, 50, 100 pounds whoppers uh, of fish. The silver variety of these carps are the ones that you see on YouTube that leap out of the water and, you know, the whack the, uh, the people in their boats as they're cruising along here. And then um, they, they really eat uh, the, uh, a tremendous amount of, of plankton in the uh, environment. So they will be in direct competition with the fish that are uh, here and native and fish that we, uh, that we desire. Uh, there's a version of, of these uh, invasive carps called grass carp um, that are in Lake Erie right now in Lake Ontario in very, very small numbers. Um, and we're trying to remove uh, those before they actually get a toehold and, um, and, and become established. But those, uh, they uproot sub submerged aquatic vegetation. So think of all the, those plants and wetlands that um, fish hide behind or lay their eggs in, or even that um, you know house birds uh, for the bird watchers. So uh, it would be quite devastating if these, if these invasive carp species became established uh, in the Great Lakes. There are other species like uh, tench, uh, which has um, the possibility of becoming established and causing harm. And then uh, there's the unknowns as well um, that could be coming in in that next ship um, that's coming into the Great Lakes system from overseas that might have living organisms um, in the ballast water or um, you know, might swim their way in through a shipping canal. But the, the invasive carps are the ones that we're really, really worried about because they're within striking distance. Um, still time to do something about it. And, the good news on that one is that governments, uh, the, the Canadian federal government, the province of Ontario, uh, the state governments, the U.S. government, are all really aware of what's going on with the invasive carps and are spending um, uh, considerable amounts of money to build physical structures to keep them out, but also devoting uh, money to science. Um, the Canadian uh, researchers at Fisheries and Oceans Canada, for example, are doing some of the best science, uh, University of Toronto. Uh, anywhere uh, in the world on invasive species and the risk that they pose. Yeah, we're hoping to have one of these conversations with someone from Fisheries and Oceans about Asian carp uh, coming up in the next few weeks. And I know there's even a hotline where people spot them, that they want them to be reported so that they can uh, try and deal with them as quickly as possible. So we'll try and share that uh, reporting hotline in the chat, maybe for people who are watching. Uh, it's important also, to know. So yeah. to let people know if you see them. And I would also um, urge folks to visit the Invasive Species Center. You just need to Google that. 
uh, which is a uh, cooperative center set up between the province and the, um, and the federal government uh, to um, deal not just with aquatic species, but also terrestrial species. They are some of the, um, the best people in the field uh, are doing work at that invasive species center to provide us with uh, the information and the science that we need to understand uh, the risk and why we need to take it seriously. And so, um, you know, visit that online. Um, you'll learn a lot. Um, and they are also, they're, they're doing wonderful things to help us uh, deal with invasive species policy in Canada. Great, I think we're just about out of time. Is there anything else that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you think our viewers should know? I uh, think uh, that this has been a great conversation and I've enjoyed talking with you. I've, um, members of my team have visited Ripley's and, and um, seen the aquarium, but I've not had the opportunity yet um, unfortunately, the board has been, board has been closed for about a, more than a year, and um, normally I'd, I'd spend a, about a week a month in Canada, and I'm, uh, I will tell you that the uh, uh, first chance I'm back in Toronto, which I'm hoping will be soon, I'm stopping by and, um, and get to see not just the sea lamprey display that you have there, but all the other things, and folks have, in my uh, team have, um, have raved about the, uh, the displays at Ripley, so uh, I've, I've just been thrilled to be a part of this conversation. and. Um, uh, thank you for uh, bringing this to people's attention um, and to also highlighting really what's great about um, fisheries and science. And I hope that you've motivated people to go into science as well uh, for a career because we need uh, good scientists. For sure. I think this year has highlighted the need for science so much more than ever before. And there's so much more to learn. Uh, and yeah, I agree. I hope this conversation maybe sparks the interest of some of our younger viewers to, to learn more and, and hopefully pursue science into the future. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and for your nice compliments about the aquarium. We'd be happy to host you whenever you're able to, co to come and visit and same with everyone watching. We're excited to be able to welcome you back uh, at some point in the future when it's safe to do so. Thank you. Uh, All right. Okay, so we'll leave that there for today. Tune in in the coming weeks for more of these conversations. Thanks so much, everyone, for watching, and take care from Replace Aquarium of Canada.